So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you're based around the world. Um, my name is Thomas Beatty, and I'm a senior medical statistician at PHMR. So, what PHMR is, it's a consultancy that specializes in uh, market access and reimbursement and works generally with big pharma to help support patient access to vital medicines. My role within PHMR is to design and develop comparative analyses to support patient submissions and also the design and implementation of real world evidence studies. And prior to PHMR, I completed my PhD at Imperial College London. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about quantum bias analysis for unmeasured founding in non randomized studies. And we're going to demonstrate this through an implementation in R through a fictitious case study. And at this point, I just want to thank John Luca, Howard, and Porek, and James, and everyone supporting the R PhD workshop and initiative, and for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you all today. Thomas, sorry to interrupt, just a little bit like maybe presentation earlier on the audio quality on your microphone isn't brilliant if you had another microphone it might be worth switching over if you don't i don't think it's worth worrying about but uh it might just be the case of speaking uh speaking up and, and, and clearly sorry for the no worries yeah i'll shout a bit louder if that helps um so Okay, so first I'm going to give you some background on um, why quantum bias analysis of QBA might be useful, what it is, and how we would use it. Then I'll introduce our fictitious case study uh, that we use to motivate the use of QBA. And then we'll look at an implementation of two QBA approaches in an hour, one using an existing package and another that's a simpler approach that's from scratch, implemented from scratch. Uh, we'll also show the results in the implementation of the QBA using a case study, the case study that we mentioned. And then finally, I'll close with some thoughts about using an integrated approach in R and why that might be a good idea. So firstly, this work is part of a larger body of work in QBA, which involves collaboration with Comic Salmon, who's the head of statistics and real world evidence at PHMR, and Sabrina Ramagoplin, who's the global head of real world evidence at Roche. And beyond that core team, there's several collaborations with members from NICE, UCL, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Leiden University. So let's first just start with a little bit of background. Why would QBA for unmeasured compounding be useful in a HC setting? Well, increasing personalization of medicine has led to the development of rare subconditions in a number of disease areas that were not considerably, uh, were not traditionally considered as rare. So for example, in non-small cell lung cancer, and we have LAP positive patients and so on. And the conduct of randomized controlled trials can be challenging in rare indications, particularly when combined with high human need. And in parallel to this, there's been an increase in focus on ensuring patients with higher met need gain relatively rapid access to new potentially effective treatments. And this has created an environment within which new technologists may receive conditional regulatory approval on the basis of promising a single arm or uh, early phase data. The diversity and uh, rapid evolution of the standard of care in many indications means that by the time of market launch, randomized controlled trials often often don't capture the comparison against the current standard of care. And if, it, if another randomized controlled trial, for example, comparing the standard of care to the same control group isn't available, then anchored ITCs won't be possible. Um, the figure on the right shows the increase in prevalence of single arm trials to HCA bodies globally. Uh, and that's from the Patel et al. study. On the other hand, real world data, which we've mentioned a little bit today already, um, can be used to establish an external control group. However, the problem with external control groups is that they raise additional concerns regarding bias. And this is due to a lack of, well, for several reasons, but due to a lack of standardized treatment protocols, outcome definitions, the lack of complete data on key confounders and effect modifiers, and generally just a generally just a lower standard of uh, data quality found within these data sources. 
However, in an effort to account for compounding and effect modification, analyses including external controls are increasingly including some level of adjustment. So for example, when external controls are based on historical trials, so aggregate data, um, only aggregate data is really available for these types of, of trials, historical trials, and therefore methods suitable in this setting are typically the matching adjusted indirect comparisons or simulated treatment comparisons in HTA. But when we do have IPD data available, it's possible to use more common analytical methods used in observational studies, such as regression adjustment and uh, inverse probability of treatment weighting. Despite the use of some of these analytical methods, uh, con concerns around the bias remain and limit, limit the acceptance of HTA submissions using non randomized studies. And many critiques of submissions have called for the need for real world data sources to provide more comprehensive and accurate data on key variables. And while we obviously agree with this perspective, the time frame and resources to develop such uh, sources are likely large. And even with such an investment, these data sources cannot mitigate the bias completely. When it's not possible to obtain data on all key confounders, that's to say there are unmeasured confounders, we're interested in the potential of quantum bias analysis or QBA to quantify some of the uncertainty in this setting. And on the right hand side, we have some comments from the HA bodies from submissions that use real world evidence. So broadly, QBA is just a body of methods which can be used to better understand the results of studies in the context of potential biases. Here we're focusing on QBA methods applied post hoc for unmeasured confounding. These methods are ideally applied after a primary analysis in which biases have been controlled for as far as possible through appropriate design and analysis. As such, QBA methods can be seen as complementary to these. Um, and quantum bias analysis are well established in the epidemiological literature, and a variety of methods have been developed to address biases arising from misclassification, selection, and, and confounding. The breadth of methods available covers deterministic and probabilistic approaches, Bayesian and frequentist approaches, and also approaches which can be applied both to aggregate and patient level data. Despite more than 200 HTA submissions that include external controls, we're not aware of any methods, QBA methods, that we use to support the consideration of the non-randomized evidence in the HTA setting. So quickly, just to understand where QBA might fit into the workflow of comparative evidence generation. Well, firstly, assuming we have the usual setup, with a primary data source and study design that will be pre-specified. Uh, and then we have a primary analysis and corresponding results. As always, an assessment of the potential biases that may impact our results should be completed before any analyses. However, an additional step may be to search for external sources of information that could be used to inform the parameterization of the QBA methods. Then once we have this information and we can parameterize a QBA method, and we'll get to that, we can conduct a QBA analysis on the results from the primary analysis, which finally then gives us the adjusted results uh, for the hypothetical unmeasured confounder. So to finish up on the background of QBA, generally there are two broad categories of approaches within QBA methods that we're discussing, bias-adjusted methods and threshold-based approaches. Uh, bias-adjusted approaches adjust the results of the original analysis to reflect those that would have been observed if certain levels of bias were removed or accounted for. So for example, that might allow us to make statements like um, assuming brain metastases increases the hazard of death by 50% and brain metastases are twice as common in those using treatment A than those using treatment B, then the hazard ratio would have been 1.2 rather than 2.1. For the threshold-based approaches, um, what they do is they try to determine how big a bias would have to be to change the result by a pre-specified amount. So this 
typically means uh, typically refers to rendering the results to the null. So, for example, these approaches may allow you to make statements such as for for a confounder to fully explain the observed association, they'd have to increase the hazard by seventy percent and be twice as common in those using treatment A than those using treatment B. And then the reader is left to interpret if brain metastases could have such an effect. Today, we're going to focus on two bias adjusted QBA methods to adjust the treatment effect under varying assumptions of the image confounder, and that's a Lang ending method. So, now let's introduce the case study that we use to illustrate the methods in our. So, um, artificial data was created to illustrate the QBA methods. So, a single data set was generated to reflect what we consider a plausible scenario that may arise in an oncology setting, particularly for some oncogene positive populations where there's going to be limited information and potentially only single arm trials are conducted. So, for example, this could be in, as I mentioned before, LAK positive or uh, EGFR positive metastatic non stem cell lung cancer. So, specifically, individual patient level overall survival data and corresponding progression, progression free survival were simulated representing about 300 hypothetical study participants. And for simplicity of demonstration, two measured baseline characteristics, a binary treatment variable and a binary image component that were also generated. The OS and PFS kappa my curves are shown on the right, the artificial population, along with the numbers at risk. And we set the effect of your measurement parameter on the outcome to a hazard ratio of 3.43. So this magnitude of association is plausible based on the strength of prognostic factors that are often unavailable in real-world oncology data sets, such as performance status and, and tumor stage, particularly tumor stage. Um, so I should say that this data was uh, used, was uh, developed uh, by using the method described in Bender et al, 2005, and all, uh, all that analysis and simulation was conducted in R. Now quickly, just to give a brief overview of the methods that we're gonna use, so we can see them in the implementation. Um, the first is the approach by Huang et al, and that's a patient level approach. Um, so that's whereby an image confounder is simulated given the estimated marginal probability of the image confounder and sensitivity parameters specified to quantify the uh, assumed association between the image confounder and the treatment received and between the image confounder and the large hazard of the outcome. The approach assumes a single binary image confounder and there's a, an existing package developed in our called SERVSENSE. The second approach, second method, is a uh, aggregate level approach. That is an approach applied with only aggregate data is available, and that's described in Dingadal. Uh, this approach adjusts the point estimate and corresponding confidence interval on the aggregate level. The sensitivity assumptions are quite here, uh, an association between the emergent confounder and the outcome, and between the emergent confounder and the treatment. And then under the assumption of a rare outcome and a binary treatment effect, uh, a binary metric parameter, sorry, uh, a bounding factor can be defined and used to adjust the estimated treatment effect. But as you may recall from the Kaplan layers in the previous slide, we're not in the rare outcome setting. So to overcome this limitation, the square root transformation is used to estimate a relative risk from a hazard ratio for a non-rare outcome. And then the bounding factor formula which is provided um, for our relative risk was used to adjust the estimated treatment effect. And this method is implemented in our without a package. And it's relatively straightforward, as you'll see in a minute. So now we're going to take a look at the implementation in R for these methods. So first we're going to take a look at the implementation for the Wang method using the existing substance package. On the right hand side, I've just put out some of the documentation from the serve sense package on the serve sensitivity function, and that's the main function within the package. On the left is the setup for the implementation. I haven't shown it here, but the first step would obviously be to install the package, and then we can load that package up ready for use. 
Now we're going to have to provide the method with parameters we mentioned earlier, uh, namely the marginal probability of the image of parameter, which is denoted by theta, the range of coefficient of the image compounder in the response model, and that's denoted by zeta t, and the range of the coefficients of the image compounder in the treatment model, and that's zeta z. And it's important to know here that we're also providing multiple function values for theta t, the zeta t and zeta z, and that's because we also have uncertainty about the input parameters, and we would like to reflect this in the outcome. Now we set up a couple of uh, empty arrays that uh, will output the adjusted point S metal corresponding standard errors to. So the empty arrays that we'll create are three dimensional, each representing a combination of input parameters. So each cell will be a combination of input parameters in the three dimensional space. Now the plan Plan is to loop through all the input parameters to obtain the adjusted point estimates and corresponding standard errors. And I do apologize in advance, but I have spelled out the nested loops for demonstration. But of course, you can tidy up the code using things like um, LPI and so on. So for the loop, um, we have a nested loop with three layers, uh, each layer looping through one of the input parameter vectors. And you can see the serve sensitivity function in the innermost area of the loop. The first few parameters given to the function um, are t, which is the survival times, g the event indicator, z the treatment indicator, and x pretreatment measure compounders. Then we have the method user fitting, and there's three options for this. We have the expectation maximization algorithm, the stochastic expectation maximization algorithm with regression, and the stochastic expectation maximization with inverse probability weights. Um, so the EM algorithm is the optimal approach, and it's what we used here. However, the other methods could be considered when combining, for example, with inverse probability weights or things like that, uh, and the application is slightly different. Uh, we've also included the arguments for zeta t, zeta z, and theta as, as previously mentioned. So we're going to use the default settings for both b and, and b m parameters, and they're related to uh, the stochastic um, expectation maximization algorithm. So that one's not really used in this setting, and uh, the bem um, parameter is set to the default value. As we loop through all the input parameters, the point estimate and standard errors are saved in the empty three-dimensional arrays that we've previously defined. So that's it for the implementation of the plan method. And next we'll look at the implementation of the ding method. So first I have to point out that no package was used in the implementation of this package, of this method, sorry. Uh, and its implementation is straightforward. First, we define the bias factor function, the BF, function. And as inputs, it takes the, the relative risk between the exposure shot and the image compounder, and also the hazard ratio between the outcome and the image compounder. Uh, the and then the function returns a bias factor, and that's what we use to adjust the estimated treatment effect. So next we define the input parameters for this model, uh, and the input parameters are the ones that I mentioned before for the function. However, as I also mentioned, this approach assumes the rare event outcome. And so to adjust for that, we apply the square root transformation to the hazard ratio between the outcome and the image confounder, and then use these relative risks instead. That is, these relative risks approximate the hazard ratio in the bias function. So we apply this um, square root transformation and then set up some empty arrays to store the outcome. And then finally, we're just looping through the input parameters, calculating the bias factor each time, and adjusting the observed point estimates and corresponding confidence limits, and saving those to the predefined arrays. So to adjust here, we just divide the observed values by the uh, bias factor. So that is the implementation of both QBA methods. 
Now we'll take a brief look at the, uh, at the results. So in each of these plots, the dashed line represents the observed value that is unadjusted for the omega compounder. And the solid line represents the true value. And because it's an artificial data set, we know the true value. So first in plot A, we can see the box plots of the point estimates for each of the methods. And you can see that both methods perform uh, relatively similar and also quite well. Uh, if we take the median of the adjusted estimates, you can see the reduction in bias compared to the observed or, or the unadjusted value. That is, the adjusted outcomes are much closer to the true treatment effect. Um, in addition, we also implemented a three-state partitioned cost-effectiveness model, which is common in, a, in an oncology setting. And we developed this model in order to produce the, the HGA relevant outcomes for decision-making in cost-effectiveness markets. For example, like in the uh, UK, England and Wales, uh, be it nice. Um, so plots B and C show the deterministic sensitivity analysis, both the incremental cost effectiveness ratio and the net monetary benefit. And both were closer to the true value after applying the QBA methods. Of course, it's really important to note and to caveat this with that these methods are wholly dependent upon their parameterization. And that's a whole other hour discussion about uh, the parameterization of these methods and how to get that information from various sources. Uh, in addition to the deterministic analysis, which I've just shown, we also implemented uh, probabilistic sensitivity analyses. Uh, the main plot shown here um, shows the cost effectiveness plane, which is the change in cost, so the delta cost versus the change in quality adjusted life years, or delta qualis. And this is generated by a probabilistic sensitivity analysis showing the true and observed relationships, as well as those estimated by the two QBA methods that we looked at, the Hawaiian ending methods. And in order to help with seeing the differences, as uh, it's quite difficult in the, uh, in the cost effectiveness plane, we've also plotted the marginal densities for the change in costs and the change in polis. So you can see that the bulk of the, the QBA adjusted outcomes are closer to the true qualis density. Uh, in blue, then the observed quality density, uh, observed density of polis, I should say, in the top part of plot. So that's in that kind of uh, orangey, orangey color. Um, also, just to mention that the black line represents uh, on the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness plane represents a nominal thirty thousand pound per quality threshold. So that's the results of this QBA analysis. Just to give you a flavor using R. And now I'm just going to get some, some conclusions. So as we've seen, implementing QBA approaches in R is very straightforward, particularly if there's existing packages for the more complex approaches. Um, so for example, the Huang et al. Uh, method, that would be quite difficult, if, if not impossible, in some instances to implement in Excel due to the estimation method. However, that's not unique to the Hawaiian method, any QBA approach that uses, um, let's say, less standard methods of estimation presents challenges for, um, presents challenges for in the estimation when it comes to implementing Excel. Therefore, if QBA was to be used directly within Excel, it would limit the approaches that we have available to more simplistic approaches. The other option, of course, is to do what we did in this case study, and that's to implement the QBA in R and then feed the, those results into Excel uh, for the cost effectiveness model. Um, however, that involves a manual step, and that's easy, very easy to introduce mistakes, as I found out. And additionally, when there's uncertainty in the QBA input parameters, we may want to specify, as we did here, a range of input parameters. However, that gives us several adjusted outcomes and corresponding com confidence intervals. So when we're conducting, say, the probabilistic sensitivity analysis, we want to sample a single value from several distributions. So we'd have to implement some type of multi-stage sampling in Excel, whereas if we're in R, we could use existing packages that are already available for this. 
Another important issue, and that's been touched on a couple of times in the previous talks, is scalability. And this is related to the economic model itself in itself. Running this economic model for several input parameters in the QBA is slow, very slow. Um, or because it's much faster computation, will allow us to use and sample from a wider range or, or distribution of input parameters that would be just way too slow in Excel. Um, so the, the, the table on the right here just describes some of the implement, uh, implications related to QBA, given the, the language that was used for implementation for the comparative analysis, the QBA and the cost effectiveness model. And essentially just what we're saying here is that the more elements conducted in R, the more integrated the workflow, the better availability of methods for QBA, and the less likely we are to make mistakes through manual steps. So at a minimum, it's recommended that the QBA component be implemented in R to avail of the range of available methods. However, an integrated approach whereby the comparative analyses, QBA and the economic model uh, are conducted in R is, is obviously preferable. So although maybe lofty ambitions, but I look towards the future, um, collaboration through the Alpha HTA and external partners could come together to think about developing an R package that essentially wraps the functionality of the current economic modeling packages along with um, additional HTA relevant functionality. And such a package could include a, a QBA component. So that's, that's it for me. Uh, many thanks for your attention and uh, I welcome, welcome any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thomas. Thanks an awful lot. So uh, there's an interesting discussion going on in the chat that I might direct you to in a second when you get a, a chance to, to look over this. And this is just a, this is a, it's a discussion about vectorization versus loops and the particular functions that you're using. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily in, in the, inherent to the, the methods that you're, you're uh, demonstrating here, but just also just the, the structure of, of the um, outcomes that, uh, in the way that you're uh, creating the three-dimensional arrays versus maybe just creating long vectors and whether or not certain functions can, can take them. But it, just as, as part of the question of optimizing this, the speed. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of these type of demonstrations with synthetic data. Um, and I think it creates a very, very transparent example um, do you have this in in, uh, in 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 submission anywhere, or is this is are we going to see this as a publication? Yeah, so like I said, it's part of a wider body of work on QBA. So we have a publication just accepted on considerations in the HTA setting, and then a corresponding paper, uh, which is currently under review. That's more on this topic where we have a um, yeah look at an artificial data set and look at the effect of QBA approaches in different settings. Lovely. I, I think the the graphical representation of the deterministic and the probabilistic results are very, very interesting to see what's uh, what's going on there. I think that makes things very clear. Maybe I just want to go on to, to some of the questions in air that have been posted in the discussion. So I think the latest this is coming from um, from me, just about the, the relevance of, um, of your results to judging which of these methods are, are, are better. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you just want to look at the specifics of of the question that may have posted in, in, in the discussion that might be the easiest way of addressing it most directly. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's a really good question and, and this was asked by reviewers. So um, yeah, very good question. Um, so we didn't look at comparing the methods in the analysis that we conducted and I would be reluctant to draw any conclusions on how well the methods work uh, comparatively, just because there are several scenarios and edge cases that would have to be uh, examined um, before coming to some conclusions like that. However, there are benefits um, of, of the Ding method, maybe over the Huang method, depending on, on the application. So um, the number of parameters that you need and the information that you need uh, is, is, is smaller and to a lesser extent in the Ding method than the Huang method. So that information may be more readily available in the literature or through expert opinion, for example, than, than for example, that you need for the Hawaiian method. Super. 
thanks and then also this is the presentation has obviously prompted a, a bit of uh, thought and discussion here so uh dawn is also asking about the rationale for using these methods and whether or not they'll really be considered um acceptable and she's noticing about you know straying from the original trial data and possibly introducing more uncertainty rather than alleviating it um and uh, and she's asked, have you considered submitting yourself? And I don't know, is that a question about academic journal submission or submission, I suspect, in in, in terms of um, HTA application? Has this hit the road in terms of a real reimbursement application? Well, I mean, it's a really good question. And it's, uh, it's obviously a big topic of discussion when we're working in this area. So uh, currently we're not aware, of, as I mentioned, we're not aware of PBA being used in any HTA submissions. Um, the fact that we'll, we'll be used in the future, well, I mean, that really depends upon the um, familiarity of these methods within, within HA bodies and how they can be demonstrated to effectively reduce that uncertainty, um, particularly when there's really good high quality data out there to parameterize the methods. So we're not suggesting that this would likely be your primary analysis in any HA submission. But it could be one of those, you know, sensitivity analyses that you submit along with your main analyses, and just to quantify or try to explain any uncertainty that might be induced from a missing or measured compounder. Okay. Um, so in the current NICE framework, uh, but they put out real world evidence, they actually make reference to this QBA work that we're doing and are considering uh, some discussion around this uh, in the future. Yeah, I think that's a, an important point about yeah the, the acceptability of the method rather than just outside of the academic sphere. So Dawn also had a follow-on question which uh, neatly articulates something that I was curious about as well. And just when we were looking at the, the dispersion of the of the quality outcomes and the probabilistic analysis, um, we we can see that the Wang method has got this much greater variance, and that seems paradoxical because usually when we've got patient level data, we're expecting a good fit. So Dawn is asking what's uh, what's what's driving that. So yeah, that, that really comes down to the parameterization and methods. So it depends how good uh, you have data you have to inform the parameterization of these approaches. So for the Wang method, there's um, three main uh, parameters that you need to estimate, and depending on the information that you have to estimate these, that would determine how uncertain your results are. Um, so we wanted to represent a kind of a realistic scenario where you wouldn't have obviously perfect data and that there are uncertainties around, around the input parameters. So the spread of that is really down to uh, the, in our case, I think it's the estimated marginal probability of your measurement founder. Essentially, we're saying that uh, we're not sure how common this measure founder is in the treatment groups. And so we've specified a range for that and that describes the spread that you see in the, in the probabilistic sensitivity. Okay, and so given that you're using uh, synthetic data and you've got the ability to control this, uh, you, you could use a, a better parameterization if you wanted to, to eliminate this. Is that something that you're showing in, in a sensitivity analysis in the paper that you can really demonstrate that it does come down to that? Yeah, so in, in the paper, we actually look at three different scenarios. Um, one, so you consider a good scenario, let's say, where you have very good information, although not perfect still, because uh, we want to keep it realistic. We have a scenario where we're in a poor setting where it may be based on expert elicitation and uh, maybe on a very few experts as well. And we also have a, a scenario where the parameterization is completely incorrect and uh, the effect that that has on the results. So I think it's important to show each of these steps to show that these methods are sensitive to the parameterization and we're not trying to hide any fact that if you don't parameterize those well, they're not going to work very well. Super. Okay, I think that's addressed the questions that are placed there. I, as I mentioned, there's, there's a uh, there's further discussion between Howard and Rob Smith about the, the different um, uh, the different ways of, of, of implementing loop or, or vectorization, but I might leave that to the to respond to the chat just because we've uh, come to time now.